how, how did you uh, get the idea of producing a book, uh, two photographers in one book? Normally we see one photographer who publishes its own book and maybe also the story behind this book. Right? So uh, around 2003 is when the idea started. And when, when I had a sponsor that brought me into the project to photograph the, for a book in Mustang. And Luigi was the conservator at the time, and he was not part of a book project yet. And then I did two more expeditions um, to visit there and photograph in 05 and 06. And by that time, we had enough to start really thinking about the book. And Luigi had, had been always doing photography during the restoration and uh, you know, capturing the Tibetans being trained and, and restoring and cleaning all the paintings. <clears throat> so he already had a lot of good work, and and then you know he got serious about getting into well, photography. Yes, I started seriously taking photos like two thousand four. Okay, just I interrupted, but then he continues. Yeah, sure, sure, go on. You I, bought an Nikon. Yeah, in two thousand four, I became in charge of the conservation uh, project, so to document the work, I bought a better camera. Before I had an old DSLR, and now no, not DSLR, um, thirty five millimeter. Uh, but for the project and have the facility or laziness to see the, what you were doing, I had to buy a digital reflex uh, and that's how it started. Because mm -hmm. when I had the digital files I could see and improve. So I studied basically photography in Mustang by candlelight. And and I, and I was encouraging him because I started honestly to see an eye. He was really beginning to do serious yeah. creative photography, not just documentary of, of the project. And I saw that he had a beautiful, loving eye, and I really wanted him to concentrate on not just the restoration, but trying to photograph and, and his photography as an art. So he started to really do that, and, and I was really encouraging, and I'm glad I did. Yes. And he, he got better and better and better to the point where Honestly, I thought that some of his photographs were unique and creative and, and striking enough that I thought they should be in the book. So I, I proposed to my sponsor, I would like to bring Luigi into the book. Right. And some of, some of his images, at least some of them, um, where he, the, the ones that really cr grabbed me at first are not even in the book. They were motion studies of the, of the monks and lamas dancing at the festivals, where he moved the camera and they were blurred, but really you know, to create a beautiful work. And, I, and I, those are the ones I really loved. And I said, don't you think these are unique and amazing? He says, yes, invite him in, absolutely. And that's how it became two people. And then he just, he got excited about that and he started photographing more. He thought, okay, I'm gonna be in this book too. So he started really photographing more and more and more and more. Yeah. And I think that your production, you know, the creative production that came out of you was accelerated because of the excitement of the book. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then we just kept, trying to get the book published because it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, it was really hard. I mean, it, it, by this time he was definitely going to be in the book and, and actually as it turned out, that sponsor left the project. He was no longer part of it even though we tried very hard with him to get a book, pro and a book published, but we never, he wanted to do uh, a, a, um, a self-publish. Okay. I wanted to do a real publisher like Hammer, you know, okay. but he, we, we locked horns on that. And it was one of the things that tore us apart because I just refused to do a, a, a vanity project uh, in the, you know, self-published. So we went our separate ways and, and then um, I continued just by myself to really try to find a publishing agent and who could find a publisher. And I was just you know, persevering, obsessing over this for years and years and years from 08, 09 until... Okay. 2018, 2019, for 10 solid years, just trying to find a way to do this. And finally, the Ansel Adams family, the famous black and white photographer in America, um, I'm very close to, and his daughter-in-law was close to this publishing agent, Barbara Cox, and introduced us. And Barbara had been to Mustang, and she went there with you know, her cousin and a few close friends, and they had a spiritual experience. It was an epiphany. It was a really a big thing for her life-changing experience for her. And when I approached her about a book on Mustang, she's like, oh my God, yes. I would love to do a book on Mustang. <laughs> really got excited to the point where she decided to um, forego her normal fee, 
we, mm-hmm. we, we paid her very little compared to what she usually gets because she was personally, passionately involved in wanting to see this book happen. And she went to the Frankfurt Book Fair twice, three times, you know. It, we, we then switched maybe to doing an exhibition first because we just couldn't get the publisher, but then it came back to the book first, which is what I wanted. And, and uh, by this time, of course, Luigi was absolutely, I felt, first author. <laughs> it switched from inviting him for a few pictures to feeling that he should be first author. And, and he is first author on the book. His name is first. And, and, and he has more pictures, twice as many pictures as I have in the book. All of the restoration, all of, all of the cleaning, all of the completion, which is really the unique point of the book, you know, they're all his photographs, all of those. I did landscape and some festivals and, some, and, some, and a lot of the paintings that I shot from scaffolding with a large format camera to get well, but the book would not, it would not be what it is if it wasn't for his involvement. I'm so thrilled because he deserves it more than I do. He spent 22 years, 22 years, six months a year up in this freezing godforsaken place, you know, and, and trying to restore these paintings, bucking the, his, you know, the, the prevailing conser- conservation um, ethics. ethics of the world, you know, the, that you shouldn't complete and you shouldn't paint and just clean. Yeah, and, sure. and, and, you know, he was really putting up with a lot of, a lot of controversy and, and continuing to finish the paintings with the blessings of the American Himalayan Foundation, which funded it and got it all done. And, and it, you know, it's a great success story, I think, for the people, of, the Tibetan people, to have these, these temples restored and, and the story of their restoration that they requested so, so they could pray in these, in these temples as living, daily breathing rituals that they have for the living, breathing part of their culture, and not just a museum, which is what's often done. That, that was really the point of the, of the whole project, and, and it really is Luigi's project. I was just a, a keen observer. <laughs> but an observer without him, this couldn't have been possible. Yeah, I mean, I was the one that was more obsessed about getting the book. I didn't give up. And he would say, he would laugh at me. He says, you just won't give up on this, you know. And I just never gave up. That's right? how work. Yeah. Yeah, I obsessed over getting a, a publisher. And, nice. and even when Barbara started going, I don't know if this is going to work, Ken, I just like, no, don't let go. Don't stop. Don't give up. And, and uh, when, when she got Hammer, I was just, I'll never forget that day. I just screaming around the house. And like, my neighbor was like, what's the matter? What's the matter? <laughs> I was so thrilled, you know, real publisher, you know, not some Mickey Mouse Bush League, but a real top German, a top German publisher, you know, like Tosh and Tenoyes. I mean, this is, he's first here, and I was just thrilled to pieces. And now here we are, literally, at one of the finest printers in the world that prints for Salgado, for Christ's sakes, and, and Tosh and Tenoyes and everything. I can't believe it's happening. I just can't believe I'm so thrilled to pieces, I can hardly really sleep. Happy. Thank you. You know, we just, we really, we scored, we made it happen, you know. So that's how it got to be two people. Nice. Really nice story. Yeah. It's the shortest I've ever told it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spared you. <laughs> well, it's more than 20 years, so it's quite... Yeah, that's right. It was really a lot of painful episodes that I left out. A lot of pain. But yeah, 22 years. I mean, it's, and I was there six weeks, four times. He was there six months, 22 times. <laughs> and I'm not, in a, I'm not a match. I did the best I could with the time I had. Yeah. And I wasn't being paid. I've never been paid for the project. He was at full salary. So I'll just ask another question as you... I uh, told that super yeah. wonderful story. <laughs> Couldn't match any other answer, probably. But, but you know, the real story of the, of the reason for the conservation yes. and the whole ethics, you know, you may want to say some more about that. I'm talking about the story of the book, but the story of the, what really yeah, happened in yeah, the, 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 the... You may want to say, if you have time to... Yeah, yeah, sure. He tells that story better than me. Yeah, well, I'll try also to be short, because uh, when we arrived uh, in uh, Mustang, we were three uh, mm-hmm. international, mostly Italian conservators and we were told turn farmers into restorers okay so we slowly reached the number of 40 farmers um, and uh, we had to train them in conservation to preserve their own cultural and heritage and i was fresh out of my studies uh, the professor with whom i graduated was the uh, no, it was a private school. I tried to go to the Benigol Rally two, three times, and my story is even longer because I started with aeronautical <laughs> engineering. 
so I left uh, aeronautical engineering uh, after a few years and then I okay. started painting and then I went to research there are many things that brought me to Mustang. Uh, so I, when I arrived, I was there with my professor, and he was the boss for some years, and I was uh, his assistant. And fresh out of the studies, we were just working our way, the Western way. So restore and work only on uh, the artwork, mm -hmm. as it is. Try not to paint, add anything, and just leave it as it is. So uh, we finished the first monastery in 2004, all nicely cleaned, uh, but it was missing half of the monastery. And the people, uh, the local people, the king, uh, they would come, oh, beautiful, but it's missing everything. We can't use the monastery. And at the time, we were still colonialists, and we were forcing them to follow our rules. Part two, after a sip of coffee. <laughs> so you were talking about the training of the, training of the Tibetan mobile. Yeah, yeah, but mobile. also we were at the point where uh, the, the monastery was finished in 2004, the first one, and for the locals it was not. But we were enough <coughs> colonialists still to say, I'm sorry, we are not painting anything. We're not doing anything. And we moved to another monastery in the same village. Years passed by and people were always pushing and pushing and uh, I was leaving more and more with them and understanding what they needed. So we started reconstructing the bits and pieces more and more and more until the point that the king asked the foundation uh, to complete Tubjan, which was the first monastery that we left uh, unfinished for them. Okay. And then I said, yes, let's do it. So we started painting what was missing, uh, deciding to accept the needs uh, we were there to help them the way they needed, not the way we wanted. Sure. Uh, it took me a long time to understand that, so it was not just a journey mm -hmm. <laughs> to Mustang. Uh, this project was just seriously an inner journey. Try to understand and respect other different people, uh, requirements or choices, uh, styles of life, uh, and I had to compromise my... Mm, compromise, yes, it's a compromise, because the moment I decided to paint what was missing, uh, I was... Uh, drawing the line and cutting the borders uh, of the Western uh, world, mm -hmm. uh, which costed a lot of uh, critics. Because this project went to the front page of New York Times, uh, there are many documentaries made on uh, our work uh, and why we're doing it. So it was uh, not easy choice to make, uh, but uh, it was the right choice at the end. So that is very short. Summer. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a choice that the king personally requested, begged, yeah. begged you. At the end, begged because after the first so many years that we refused, the, he was seriously pleased with Luigi uh, through Richard Blum, right. which was the main donor mm -hmm. Richard Blum was and the, the owner of the foundation, okay. right. the American Himalayan Foundation. The founder and, and president, the chairman you know, of the American Himalayan Foundation, the king begged him and he came uh, to me uh, and said, Luigi, would you like to paint what's missing? And at that time I didn't even let him finish, yes. And I apologized after to the king and to the people that I didn't realize it before. That mm -hmm. we were, yeah. yeah. No, no, that I didn't understand before that I, uh, if I wanted to help them, I had to help the way they needed, not the way right. I studied. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a good example yeah. of cultural Yes, exactly. Because it just isn't done. What he did was just, it's not done in, in the conservation field. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing like this. And this, uh, that's why critics poured. And now there are a few more projects that are starting, of course, held by local, uh, from Eastern uh, conservators or other people who are trying to do the same. So it's actually nice to see that other people are trying to, other people means always Asian, East. Uh, Eastern, and I hope this book will try to open the minds of the Western people. Start a movement. Uh, why this? I don't know. I just hope that they will understand <laughs> that <laughs> that they cannot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that there can't be uh, a single way to do make things when there are different cultures involved, and this can apply to everything. At the end, uh, conservation is just one really field. It can apply to any other. Life. Uh, yeah, I, I personally studied uh, cultural mediation, so for me it's really nice to, uh, to hear that. Oh, yeah. you did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we hope the title of the book gets, you know, gets that message across. Renaissance for them, you know. 
Yes. Okay, so that the thing they always mention uh, that they never wanted a museum, but they wanted a living um, place to pray. So they needed a complete, uh, for their way of seeing the religion, because for them, if there is no a complete Buddha, there is no Buddha. Uh, this, you need to be a bit more into the culture, because they, uh, when they consecrate the monastery, the monks, the lamas, then they are consecrating, they uh, kind of pass the spirit of a Buddha, Bodhisattva, from the eater to the whole painting. So the whole paintings after the consecration becomes the deity. Oh. But they so, have to be complete. So if there are yeah. some missing leg or uh, half a <laughs> yeah, Buddha, yeah. missing hand, they <clears throat> cannot consecrate because a Buddha or a pure spirit cannot live in a broken thing. Broken body. Okay. Yeah. Thing and I was thinking also statue said applies to everything Throne, that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the restoration by painting has also a practical. Uh, yeah, because it, once you reconstruct the full image, they will they will, uh, they will uh, consecrate. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the image will become alive, and they will start uh, uh, praying again and also taking care. Because if there is no deity for them, it's just a painting that just don't care, and that's how. Many monasteries in uh, Tibetan uh, areas are just um, being let uh, down, uh, just crumbling because there is nothing. Uh, they only pay attention in some that have been westernized because there is a entry ticket, uh, westernized only because they've been turned into museums. Okay. Which is something I would. I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah. okay. And, we, and we, we talked about this yesterday, you know, the, the idea of the sacred. You know, like what's sacred to the conservators and all over Europe and everywhere is to just preserve what's there and not change it. Mm -hmm. Just clean and yeah, preserve and, and keep them intact. And that they, it's sacred to them that way, right? But in fact, it's more sacred if you make it, you know, appropriate for the culture who's worshipping in this building. Yeah. That's more sacred yeah. to finish the painting, blending it perfectly. And he spent a long time with experts trying to choose what to paint in these missing places because they were gone. They had stored things up against this wall for centuries, cracking yeah. the plaster, it all flaked off. There was nothing there. They had no idea what was there. There was not even just little outlines of anything. He had to just make it up. And they went to many other monasteries and temples that were Tibetan and in Tibet and, and, and they just tried to decide what should go there. And, and you know, the, the Sakya Trizin, who yeah. was the only other you know, the only other um, high Tibetan Lama that has the title His Holiness, number two below the, the, the Dalai Lama, he came, he became involved in the project. Luigi, you know, traveled to India to, with all these drawings that he had to approve every one of them. He did the foreword for the book and saying how important, the, you know, what's happened in Mustang is to the Tibetan culture. It's a beautiful foreword. And, uh, and that, you know, that was a big process. Yeah. You should yes. talk more about and, that. Yeah, the big change I was trying to highlight that we developed conservation giving more importance to art rather than why such thing was made. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, you could be purist if it's an artwork without religious meaning. So, uh, like the new, uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, not religious paintings or work of art. The moment there is religion involved, things change. I always give the comparison, yesterday the same, I told them, how many people are going to the Sistine Chapel to pray? Nobody. They go to see Michelangelo. But Michelangelo, <clears> when <throat> he painted the Sistine Chapel, was for people to go in and pray. Yeah. But through the centuries, we became so self-centric that we put God, art uh, higher than God, higher than religion. And we are trying to do this all over the world with any conservation project. And there I stepped in a, into a situation where they told me, no, religion is actually more important than art. We don't care if this is done by Michelangelo. We want to come and pray. And that's the way to me it should be uh, when the artwork is religious, if people want to um, use it. And this also, uh, there are so many shades uh, this applies in certain cultures. Here now we are brackets, we almost forgot God because we gave more importance to art and this is how we developed our society. The majority of course is not everybody is thought. The other side of the world, they decided to still keep that section alive, the religion and the, 
the sacred. So we should respect that. So it's not a fight or we don't have to reconstruct at all or we have to reconstruct. It's just a fight that you have to respect if I want to do it or if you don't want to do it. Mm. And yeah. I hope the people will grab this from the text. Yeah. It's like, well, again, which is more sacred, the art? <coughs> They're both important if you want to see their own way. Yeah, that's a completely different point of view I've never thought about. Uh, so it's really nice. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. Thank you. So I can't wait to see the final book. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yes. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, Trento, printer Trento. Yeah. <laughs>